Hi, everybody. Welcome. <laughs> and welcome to our new mentor, Kristen Olson Stone. I'm so excited that you're here to just do some show and telling and critiquing and uh, and a little chatting Q&A stuff, too. So this is this is a meet the mentor event where we get to chat and um, and just see uh, see what you are all about. So I just want to say a little bit about you before I turn it over to you. So Kristen has been a professional artist and teacher for more than 20 years, and she is known for her colorful landscapes. And she works in primarily oils, but also does plenty of watercolors and watercolor sketching, which I absolutely love to see on your Instagram and everything like that. And in addition, Kristen has a great YouTube channel and I'll be putting that link in the chat as well. So you can look her up there. So Kristen, take it away. So um, yeah, I, I do work in a lot of uh, different mediums. And first of all, welcome and thank you for joining me today. Ah. Um, I do adore watercolor. When I first started um, painting, uh, I painted I paint. watercolor and then um, I started selling my, my watercolor paintings even before I was in art school um, through an art gallery in Annapolis, Maryland, which is, um, I grew up in Maryland. And then I went, up, went to art school and shifted over to um, oil paintings. And I love oil. Um, I teach acrylic, although I don't paint too much uh, myself in acrylic. Once in a while, I'll begin an oil painting with an acrylic underpainting. Um, but primarily I work in either oil or, or watercolor. I also do gouache once in a while. <laughs> um, and I paint a pretty wide range of subjects. Um, I paint mostly landscapes and um, my inspiration comes from sort of connecting with places. I love nature, um, I love traveling and uh, I just, I, I love to paint scenery from places that um, we visit. And, uh, and here in my own backyard, I'm in Palm Desert, California. So we have a lot of spectacular scenery here as well. Um, I have done a lot of paintings recently um, with palette knives. I have a whole collection of, of these guys and um, really been having fun with texture and it's um, a fast way to paint. Uh, I just completed a painting that's 50 by 60 in um, about a week and a half, which is pretty big canvas for me. Um, if I were doing that with brushes, it probably would take me three months. <laughs> so um, what I wanted to teach through this course is um, painting with oils. Um, and I was gonna do a focus on texture and palette knives. And I, I was gonna do some brushwork demonstration as well. And I'll talk about um, the brushes that I like to use. Um, but I have painted everything from super realistic watercolors to super realistic oil paintings and to semi-abstract. and. One thing I don't um, teach too much of is abstract painting, but I do teach how to make little areas of a painting that's representational abstract and sort of build your painting on lots of little abstract sections and learn to put them all together um, to make your image what it's supposed to be. Um, what else? I'm, I'm a, um, an artist ambassador for the Rembrandt Paint Company of Royal Talons and also Silver Brush. And um, I was starting to think I'm painting everything with a palette knife lately and I have all these free brushes, <laughs> but, but it's okay. I still use both, um, but, and I do love the, the Rembrandt um, paints. And um, as far as my teaching style, I'm always very positive. I um, like to give instruction that is um, tailored to each person's level and needs. And I'm pretty good at picking up how you learn. Some people learn more with verbal instructions. Some people uh, really require a demonstration. They're, they learn visually. And um, so I'm pretty good at being able to get my point across in a lot of different ways. The foundations um, that I teach, I, I don't get too emotional with my painting, but I keep everything in this outline of line, value, color, and edges. And as I get to know my students, I can also help you develop a story in your painting and learn how to put um, emotions into color and apply those colors into the right places in your painting. And that's a really fun process. Um, and so I, I, you know, if I see something with the painting and I, and I think it's the biggest problem with the painting, for instance, is design, 
I won't say the biggest problem with your painting is design. I'll say um, we need to, to break this down into, I'm just making this up, three big shapes and explain um, where those shapes need to be and why they need to be interlocking, for instance, and what the values need to be in shape one as compared to shape two as compared to shape three. I also do a lot um, with teaching my students how to see, how to see with photos and, and um, how to break up a photo into three dimensions, foreground, middle ground, and background, and um, how to, to gauge, once again, you, you take those dimensions and values have to be you know, in a range of one to 10 in the foreground, for instance, and maybe two to seven in the middle ground and maybe five or six in the background depending on the time of day of your photo, but colors change from dimension to dimension, from forward to back, and so do values, and so do lines, and so do edges. I just get softer as they go back in space. So I sort of help you analyze your reference material, analyze your photo, and figure out those things. And once you get a good handle on those foundations, you can just fly with all the textures and colors and blending, or not blending. Sometimes you just want to put a color down and and leave it. And, um, and I also, um, I do a lot of, when, when I do a lot of watercolor sketching, I do a lot of experimentation and I always encourage my students um, before they embark on a big oil painting to do a little watercolor sketch. And you can have the simplest little box. I have students who have six colors, three colors, <laughs> you know, anything, but you can kind of figure out a few, um, small, uh, you can do th small thumbnails or a six inch by eight inch sketch and you can figure out so much um, in terms of placing elements in your sketch, um, where to put them, moving things around. You can give yourself a little time and space before you embark on a big painting to play a little bit and to get acquainted with your photo. And I'm sure if you've painted before, you know what it's like to look at a photo and you, you visualize it as a painting, but getting from the photo to what you visualize, there's always some foggy areas in between where you get stuck. When you do a watercolor sketch first, um, you have a lot fewer of those foggy getting stuck times and your painting can go much more smoothly. And then the end result is a painting that looks fresh and um, your friends will say, wow, that looks so easy. <laughs> And you'll be able to tell them, well, there was a lot of preparation behind that. Um, so anyway, I've, I've done these different processes for a lot of years and um, I know what, what works and what works for me may not work for you, but I'm pretty good at helping everybody find their own path to a good method. And once you have a method down, um, you will make more steady progress. And uh, I think, anyway. that's, I think that's great. I'm especially yeah. just kind of understanding that not everybody works in the exact same way and right. you're able to kind of help people identify what works, what works for them, what, what works for every individual. And then also keeping those basics in mind, like you were saying, that really stuck out to me just about the thumbnails and just how many composition issues you can solve um, just, right. with, just with that. And I think I forget sometimes in my excitement, you know, to start a piece, just want to get going, but you can really solve probably quite a bit just with that. I, and like you said, even just with a few colors, I never thought about doing it in a little watercolor sketch. So, yeah, well, I mean, I find I'm a, um, I get anxious about starting a painting and I, and I, you know, especially if it's something I've been thinking about and maybe I needed to get a few other projects out of the way. And now I finally got the time to get started. And I'm looking at my watch and I'm thinking it's four hours till dinner, you know, I went, and I don't want to do the watercolor sketch. I just want to get right into my oil painting. But I've learned that there's so much value um, in, the, in the painting sketch, not just in the time save, but in the preparation and in, in the end result, you know, like I said, you, you come out with a much fresher painting. And so um, even though the, the mentorship is for oil painters primarily, I definitely encourage doing the, the sketching and um, planning as much as possible prior. And uh, so. Great, that's great, I love yeah. it. And I just wanna take a second to welcome Lynn and Anae and Aaron. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. And I think we might have somebody else coming in. I'm not quite sure yet. So um, 
Well, does anyone um, have any questions for anything Kristen has said so far, or shall we move on? I think we have some show and tell from Kristen. Um, anybody before we move on? I, no? I was just going to ask, like, how do you resist that um, resist that urge to just get into painting and, and skip the planning stage? Do you, <laughs> do you catch yourself sometimes, like, skipping it? or? So I have. I have done that. And then I end up having to go back into my painting and make changes. Mm -hmm. And I know from the experience of doing it both ways, preparing and doing the painting or not preparing and just jumping right into it, that um, I should have prepared, you know? And so I think as artists, we have to be um, somewhat self-disciplined, but finding the right things that work for each of us is really important. So some people, for instance, they can't start work until their studio is neat and clean or something like that. Like everybody has you know, something um, and they need to have everything organized or laid out or whatever. Um, and I do teach some of those um, uh, studio tips as well, things to just help you keep your studio organized and your paints organized um, in a way that makes it easier for you to paint and have less thinking um, and save time. But I just, uh, I, I don't always want to sit down and do the sketching. But if I think about it as play time, as much as planning time, it makes me look forward to it more. And I do have to say the more watercolor sketching that I do, I, the more addictive it is. I have become addicted to it. It's just, it's so spontaneous. Um, I love to play with the colors. And sometimes the colors blend with each other and remind me that um, those same colors in oil paint, I should blend them together. You know, in oil paint, you do all the blending work and watercolor, the water does some of the work for you and will sometimes surprise you and show you something that you might not figure out if you were just pushing the color around yourself. Yeah. So you're doing a color study then first, right? Or do you also do like a value study so, with your drawings? So, so first what I do are little thumbnail sketches and I do them, they're, you know, an inch and a half by an inch and a half if it's a square, for instance. But I do, uh, I outline the shape of whatever canvas I'm going to be um, working on, a vertical, horizontal, or square. And then within that, those dimensions, I do a small um, thumbnail sketch. Once I get one that I'm happy with, and I could do six, I could do eight, I don't know. But once I get one that I'm happy with, then from there, I do a bigger drawing um, on my eight inch by 10 inch pad or something. And then I do a, a watercolor sketch. I, I, I color in the sketch. I can show you my, I, I, I actually submitted some sketches. Um, if you wanna show them, you can see a couple. So I have the paintings that you sent me. Are those the sketches that you're? Oh, a couple of them were sketches. I can just grab my sketchbook. Maybe grab your sketchbook because I think sure. I have mainly your paintings. Okay. And yes, Anae, I can hear okay. Can everybody else hear okay? I saw that in the chat. Yes. Okay, good deal. Oh, good, Erin. You're good now? The one other thing I'll show you, this is kind of a silly tip, but we have Amazon delivery here. And I always send these um, bubble wrap envelopes, you know, with something inside. So I cut the top off and I turn it wrong side out and I keep my sketchbook inside here and it just kind of keeps the, the keeps it protected. Oh, and yeah. if I have a bag along, you know, I usually take my watercolor stuff if I'm going somewhere and I put it in a tote bag. If it gets wet, this keeps it from getting wet. So now we have it to do Fantastic. <laughs> I love those yeah. little tips. <laughs> yeah, a little recycling tip, right? Fantastic. So let's see, I'm just going to show you some thumbnails. So can you all see this? Um, Jill might spotlight you. I think that might help. Let me do that. There we go. Okay. See that? Let me just um, hang on a second. Looks like my camera's a little blurry. Ah, there we go. Can okay. Yeah. These are just some, some um, thumbnail sketches I did. Um, and this is an eight inch by 10 inch pad. So it's divided into four. And once I got one that I was happy with, then I do a full size um, sketch and paint it. 
on this. So this is the same same book. That is and this is um, Canson mixed media paper. So this isn't anything I'm going to sell. This is just for for me. This is my my book of sketches for me. So it's um, I think the paper it's 98 pound paper. Okay. So when you sketch on it for a little bit, the pages don't lay completely flat. Looks a little lived in. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay because it's for me. Um, I do like to sketch sometimes on watercolor paper. This is one I did at Laguna Beach. Mm. Um, but these little these little books are great. I also do really like bright white paper. I've been doing a series of paintings of um, Giverny. So this is one I was just planning um, this painting. I love the reflection in that water. Can you show mm -hmm. that one? This one? Yeah. 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 Oh, just beautiful. Mm -hmm. beautiful. And I think I sent you the oil painting that I eventually did from that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Somewhere in that bunch of stuff I sent you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me see. Not everyone is good that I'm, I'm excited to show you, but this is one from Italy. This is one I'm, it's in the planning stages. Of, this is from a view from a villa in Impruneta. What is, is the one. white? What is the white that you go back in and use? Is that like a, what is that? It's, it's a white acrylic pen. It's this one. Oh, it's a Posca. Yes. Yeah. If you go to my um, YouTube channel, I have this listed the exact tip and size and everything on each one of my videos has a materials list in the description so it, it gives the description of that pen but i just uh, use them to highlight i'll kind of come up close can you see the little squiggles yes of you. highlights mm -hmm. it gives it so much character i think to have that extra embellishment it gives it kind of your uh, own signature too so the pretty. reason i like these pens i've used a lot of different pens there's a lot of gel pens and different um, brands of white acrylic pens mm -hmm. but these dry dull and so watercolor is dull and if you use those gel pens a lot of them are shiny and to me it just looks funny to have shiny white lines on paper where everything is matte so these are matte when they dry and they're a nice shade of white. They seem to go with, with my paper um, really nicely. This was one I'm working on uh, another oh, painting, nice. Monet's house. I don't know if you can see it. I, it's stunning. I love it. I love your watercolors. Yeah. And sometimes I do them just for fun. This isn't ever going to be a painting. It was just one I, I did of my garden roses. <laughs> wow. So in my little bowl from Mexico. So cool, isn't it, everybody? Amazing, amazing, amazing. Beautiful. Um, well, let's go ahead and um, looks like Anae stepped away for just a second. So why don't we start with um, with looking at a couple of your oil paintings, Kristen, and sure. then I'll hop over to um, critique that we've sure. had for submission. Absolutely. Does that sound okay with everybody? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So let me share my green here in just one second. So I'll talk a little bit while you're pulling those up too. And um, people yeah. say, why do you paint in these different styles? Um, sometimes I feel like certain subjects and especially in different sizes really lend themselves to a certain style. Um, if I'm doing a small cityscape, I could do it with palette knife, but very often it looks better to do it with um, brushes. Yeah, this painting has a combination of brushes and oh no, that that sorry, that's a small one. That is all brushes. Cityscape. Yeah. Can everyone see okay? Can everybody see my screen? Everybody's yeah. good. Yep. Sorry, I just noticed my name is spelled O L S E N, but it's O N. Oh well, that's going to be on every single uh, slide, so we get to appreciate that. I'm sorry. Okay, it'll make it hard to find me if they wanted to look things up. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. I made a PDF of this, so I can't change it at this point. That's okay. Take a note. O L S O N Stone. Kristen yeah. Olson Stone. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to while while you're talking about this, I'll see if I can find a link to your YouTube and just put it right in the chat for everybody, or I'll just put it in the notes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The name will be correct on uh, the YouTube channel as well. Kristen we can make sure. Okay. okay. Okay, so this is your um, scene in Rome, right? Yes. 
I love this. It's <clears throat> beautiful. I'm noticing this gorgeous little red highlight right here too. Yeah. So um, I love rainy streets that are really reflective. It's sort of like you get double the light. <laughs> You know, shop windows are lit up, but when, when it's rainy out, then you get all those great reflections and then reflections um, set, set us the stage for you to put some figures in and put them in silhouette and um, really integrate them into the landscape. So um, it's, that's, this, that's what this painting is all about. And um, I tried to do a lot of expressive brushwork um, I teach about expressive brush work and which brushes to use and how to roll your brush and um, get nice thick strokes of juicy colors onto your canvas. That's beautiful. Let's go down here. Look at this one. Amazing. Um, yeah, now this painting is all palette knife. And you see the difference between this one and the last one? Um, very different. So this is, everything is just very clean. And um, in this style, I work from back to front and I just build the elements, you know, from back to front and with very clean a la prima strokes um, made with the palette knife and then some blending, of course, in the lake. And um, I talk a lot about how to do reflections and paint water. That so water is absolutely gorgeous. I noticed that you take that some of the brush strokes are kind of more vertical and I think that helps add to the yeah. reflective quality, doesn't it? All palette knife strokes on this one. Okay. Oh, really? Wow. They look so blended. Yeah. So, yep. I can teach how to, how to blend with a knife. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This. So, so build name in there. <laughs> <There's> the... <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, guess what? I love color. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't know it by now, now you really know it. Um, this is at an English garden and um, I really pushed the colors on this painting. I just wanted to do something that was just really bright and cheery and fun and um, really group my color families together. You can see the violets grouped together and the pinks and the yellows and the oranges. And then finally in the back, the, the warm and cool whites and then the nice big fresh green lawn. So all palette knife painting, this, this one is. This is entirely palette knife? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. In, a, in oil, right? In oil, yeah. But you could easily do this in acrylic. Most of my, my work, you can work in an oil or acrylic. I just prefer oil painting. Mm. You sent me so many beautiful ones, it was hard to narrow them down. So I'm just gonna go through a couple more and then we'll move on to our critiques. But look at this. Is this all palette knife also? This one's all palette knife too. This okay. is um, from a place called Secret Beach in Maui. And um, I was trying to get that effect of just the quietness of the evening and the gentle rolling waves and then the dramatic colors on the um, mountain in the distance, which is an offshore island called Kaho Olave and the nice colors. And I did push the colors again on this one, but um, even though the colors on the distant island are bright, it still has a lot of depth. Mm -hmm. I love that cobalt blue on that island. It's like unexpected, but it totally works. Yeah. You have to be creative sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> you have to use our artistic license. That's what it's there for. Yeah. I get okay. that a lot. So this is a totally Look, different yeah. painting. This is, um, a th I think this one's like a 30 by 40 of a tide pool. So uh, we were walking on the beach in New Zealand. And at the end of this beach, there were a whole lot of shells in the tide pools, like tons and tons of shells, more than I've ever seen in any tide pool. And um, my husband said, wow, you should paint that. And I thought, hmm, <laughs> I don't know. So I took a lot of pictures and thought about it and did this painting. And this one is all brush, all brush work. And I just sort of built up the layers and painted it one shell at a time. It took a really long time. I don't remember how long it took me to finish this painting. Well, you, should, you also sent a close up. So I'm going to do that because I think it really shows all of those individual yeah. brushes. Yeah. And it's not hyper realism or super realism or anything. It's still impressionistic. And, but if you look at um, the tools that I use to create the look of three dimension, a lot of it is just building up values, um, dark to light, and building up um, color temperature from cool to warm. And then, um, you know, luminous on top to 
getting grayer. So a lot of, there are a lot of ways to um, paint things and make them look three-dimensional. And those are some of the tools that you can use. And I've put them all into this painting. It has a nice flow. It really does. Yeah. Anybody have any comments on this? I just love it. I think it's so fun and whimsical, but at the same time, calming, like you've managed to kind of create a mood with it. Yeah. And so I also do, um, after it was dry, I did some glazing. So glazing means you take um, a transparent color. So in oil painting, there are transparent, semi-transparent and opaque colors. And so um, I took a transparent color, which was a phthalo blue and a turquoise. And I glazed those, um, meaning I painted them in very thin layers over the dry shells and then um, thin them out a little bit. And uh, that gave the effect of water flowing around the shells. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to pop over to our um, critique submissions, if that's okay with you, Kristen. Does that work? Okay. okay. We have. Let's see here. Okay, Lynn, we're starting with you. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Lynn. <Thank> Hello. <laughs> so, you love flowers too? I do. <laughs> This is beautiful. Um, oh, I love uh, I love this painting. The daisy. I'm I'm guessing it's a daisy at the top. Mm -hmm. Has a lot of really interesting patterns that you've woven into each of the petals, and I really like that. It almost reminds me of um, of a quilt. Like if you took different pieces of fabric within the same color family and cut them out into shapes and put them on onto a, a background like this blue. And um, it really makes it interesting to look at. It makes me wanna keep looking at it and keeps my eye moving. And your composition is really nice. You've taken advantage of the right vertical third. Um, I often describe breaking compositions down into two vertical thirds and two horizontal thirds um, and focusing your, your attention on um, making those strong, you know, strong sections or centers of interest or focus in your painting. And you've done that really nicely with this. I also really like the way that the flowers um, flop over in the front. It's sort of unexpected and a little bit whimsical. Um, and it just makes the painting fun to look at. And you've done a nice um, composition with a nice variety of different sizes of shapes and different, you know, interesting shapes. I think one thing that, um, that you might want to do to to adjust it a little bit the table that it's sitting on is distracting to me so when i look at the painting the first place i go is the big round flower um, just a, a little left of center and then i keep bouncing back and forth between there and the and the table so the table's a bit distracting so if i close my eye and i um and i sort of thumb out the table then I find the paintings um, a little too colorful. And so the table is definitely doing a job in keeping the colors balanced. But I think if it were just a little lighter value, uh, it would work better. Or if it went a little more towards blue. So if you were to, um, to make it, you know, so there's, so there's never any one way to solve a painting, but I just wanted to give you some things to consider and then you can sort of think about it and do the one that you think might work best. But if you did go towards making it blue, whenever you have two blues next to each other, like uh, a turquoise blue next to another blue, you always wanna make sure that the other blue is going the opposite direction on the color wheel. So if you imagine blue on the color wheel in one direction, it goes towards violet, in the other direction, it goes towards green. Mm -hmm. So your background goes towards green. So you wanna make sure that the blue that sits next to it, if it were to be the table would be a blue going in the opposite direction. And you're kind of going towards purple with this, this reddish table anyway. So you might wanna just put a little more blue okay. <laughs> back to the purple. And then I think that would support the colors in the rest of your painting really nicely um, and not, not compete with it. Let me see if there's anything else. Yeah, Lynn, did you have any specific questions about this one? No, um, I, but I love, I love the advice about the table because I changed that color so many times and I, <laughs> and I couldn't quite get it. So now that makes sense to me, a blue that goes towards purple. 
and that will pull in all these other pinks and purples. Well, we support them. Yes. We support them. So if you imagine if you were painting, um, for instance, let's say you were painting um, the ocean and the ocean and next to the sky horizon and the sky happened to be a blue sky that day. No matter what you saw, whether you were there on location or looking at a photo, you'd want to make sure that when you painted it, because you always want to make your painting work, um, that you made those two blues, blues that were going in opposite directions on the color wheel. And in most cases, either one will work. You could have a, a violet horizon and then a turquoise blue sky meeting it or the reverse. But yeah. Thank you good. so much. You're that very was welcome. very helpful. I'm so glad. <laughs> I, I have a question uh, for yeah. them. I'm just wondering about the um, the back the background of the flowers. It looks like you've just done a lot of layers, maybe with acrylic and inks and stencils, maybe. Yes, I I started with a mixed media background that almost looked like graffiti, and then I did negative painting right. to highlight the different areas with the flowers. I love that method. Thank I think you. it's so playful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. It really is. Lynn, were you looking at a like a reference photo or a still life when you did the oh. negative? Did you know where you were going with this? <laughs> no, I never know where I'm going. It comes out of my brain and I kind of just let the, the patterns uh, speak to me where I see flowers. It's great. So cool. Great. I love that method. Yeah, I like paintings that make me smile. <laughs> They're just joyful, fun. joyful, joyful. Okay, anything else on this before I move on? We have Ana. So Ana, would you like to unmute just in case we have questions for you? You bet. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to show the reference photo from down here because I think it's so fascinating uh, what you've done with it. So this is the reference photo and. I've heard you talk about this piece before, Anae, a little bit in that you just found it so great. Isn't this just like this little tree growing on an island in the middle of the lake? <laughs> it's a fallen log and a tree has grown on top of it. So it's this beautiful lake up in Kananaskis country. And it just, it's just so unique. You, this, there's this beautiful, huge lake and then you have this tree growing on a fallen log. That's really neat. Yeah, that's really pretty. Um, a couple of things uh, I would want to point out. I'm going to go to that um, option for the white screen. Can I do that? Um, I'll yeah. Let me stop. I'll have to actually. Stop. Actually, I can just do it on a piece of paper here. Okay. Well, I'm going to stop sharing so that you can so that I can spotlight you and we can see what you're doing, and then I'll go back to this one. So. Okay. Well, then I'll do the white screen. Okay. Okay, so, yeah, you do your screen share then. Okay. Okay, so you've got your tree here. This is going to be really simple because I'm drawing with my finger on a mouse pad. Okay, hold and on just a second. We're not seeing it. There we no. go. Now we got it. Okay, so here's the, this is going to be a very simple drawing, and this is just a little design tip. So, um, and your painting is beautiful, Anae, and you've definitely captured the mood of the, the mistiness of it. And it's really good, but I just wanted to show you one quick thing. <laughs> it just jumped out at me. So in the foreground, you've got a lot of, of things underwater. It looks like sunken logs or something, trees. Mm -hmm. So what you can do in your painting, um, let's say this is the, the side of it and your, I think it was off center, I'm trying to picture it in my head, I can't draw a straight line. Anyway, there are these things called construction lines. And so let's say that the tree, I'm just circling this, the tree on the log is the center of interest, right? So the construction lines radiate out from the, from the center of interest. Okay, hold on just a second. Is everybody, is anyone seeing those? I'm not quite seeing the lines. No, I, I just see the one in the middle. Yeah, we're only seeing one. So I'm wondering if there's a lag time or what's going on. So we might not be. What do you see? What do you see? We one just line. see one blue line. You only see one blue line? Yeah. Yeah. So for whatever reason, it's not. Okay. Catching. I'm going to click stop share and I'm going to do it on my notepad. Okay. Nothing like good old fashioned paper. <laughs> so I'm going to just Jill do can, Jill can spotlight you and then we'll see you better. Yeah. Let's do that. Okay. 
So here's the, sorry, here's the, um, the log that it's growing on, right? And then the tree is here. So if this is your center of interest. I'm just circling this. This is your center of interest is the tree growing out of this log. So underneath in your reference photo in this section, you had a lot of things underwater that look like trees underwater and different elements. Mm -hmm. So to create a strong foreground and bring your viewer to your center of interest, you wanna have construction lines that radiate out from the center of interest mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. And so what you wanna do is you don't actually wanna paint them like that, but that's the structure on which you would build your painting and putting those logs and things underwater you would sort of build them into these lines. And these lines aren't always straight, you know, sometimes they're wiggly and so forth. So you could look at your reference photo and pick out darks and lights in it and use that to bring the viewer to your tree. And then the rest of your painting is the background. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, so I would still paint the logs in the same direction, but they have to, or do they need to be pointing towards that? Center so, of so you would you would make a design decision that that the focus of your painting is the tree and the log, right? right. Yeah. I saw that and you said, "Wow, that's really amazing. It's really interesting, and I want to paint it, <laughs> right?" Yeah. And so you want to. Um, a lot of times, what people do in their foregrounds is they don't know what to do, so they they just sort of have a barrier here, or it's kind of fuzzy, and they put all their focus on the center of interest which you've done and you've done it beautifully, but you can create really strong foregrounds by keeping these construction lines in mind and taking elements from the painting and weaving them into these construction lines. Okay. And so they could be in the form of darks and lights. Um, like if you were gonna do maybe an easier example, let's say there is a, a wave Sorry, just a second. So here's a wave crashing, right? Here's the sea foam. And you know, when you're standing at the ocean and the wave is crashing and there's all the sea foam kind of coming up underneath. So you might say, my painting is gonna be about something simple like just this, this wave. And so underneath the wave, there's sea foam coming out. And so when you look down, you see the sea foam going in all different directions, but you wanna make your painting work and you think here's the most interesting part of your wave. So I'm gonna have all the construction lines radiate out from that. So they, you, you put this down in your sketch. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna take the sea foam bubbles and that lacy sea foam and you're gonna build that onto these lines. Okay. And they're not going to be even because it's nature and nature is not even and symmetrical. But when you get all that sea foam, for instance, put in on those lines, it'll make sense pers in perspective, mm -hmm. but you'll make the perspective work for you by taking the viewer to this important part of your wave. Maybe you have the most splash or the brightest blue or whatever it is there that makes it your center of interest. And you'll use this as a tool to make a strong foreground and then have them go to your center of interest. The foreground, the, the job of the foreground is to capture the viewer's interest and then bring them to the center of interest. Well, that for sure makes sense. Thank you. You're welcome. The creating composition. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna go back to your picture. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so your reflection is beautiful and you've got this log in the front, so I think, you can leave the log there, but then put some more um, things underwater and some dark areas to bring the attention to the tree. Okay. I really, I really like the bright colors you put into the tree. Also, the, the yellow is really beautiful. Um, and you might want to add just a little more definition to your shoreline in the okay. distance. Okay. A couple of rocks or something back there would be really nice. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, maybe a few more darks in your tree as well. Okay. Yeah, it's good to have some vertical darks. Yeah, I got a little too happy with that bright yellow. <laughs> no, not too happy. It's beautiful. 
Well, you have enough grays and toned down colors to support the really bright color in that tree mm -hmm. and the yellow. So it's working really nicely. And you've also utilized that bright vertical third to place it. So yeah, it's really nice and your blues are beautiful. One thing I struggled with is I was going back and forth with the, the color of the log and the rock. I had made them more yellow, but then it felt like it was competing with the tree and I really wanted the tree to be the center, but then the, a purple gray log didn't really look very, like it's too dull, but I don't want it to um, bring too much of it, attention to itself either. You could make it warmer. So colors get cooler as they go back in space and warmer as they come forward. So you could have, you could warm it up by putting a little bit of raw sienna or yellow ochre over it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great idea. Yeah, bring it forward. Would she do that with, are we talking about the one that the tree is on or the one in the foreground all, or both? The all one of in them. the foreground. Okay. Oh, the one in the foreground. No, okay. only the one in the foreground. Okay. So that would bring it forward and make it different from the tree, from the log in the back. Okay. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, and I was going to say, and I, I just love this bit. I feel like this bit is just so perfect that anything you do, I'm like, don't touch it. I'm always saying, don't touch it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I love your yeah. suggestion. If you yeah. wanted to, um, if you're worried about making the yellow in the grass different from the yellow in the tree, is you can have the same colors, but um, express it differently with your brush strokes. So you could make some long, skinny strokes for the grass under the tree in the same color. Oh, yes. That's a great idea. Okay. Yeah. That's and maybe awesome. some some darks and lights. So some green strokes coming up underneath the yellow. You don't want to put the green over the blue because it's too close to the blue. Right. Mm -hmm. Some nice yellow strokes would would really bring a nice, you know, keep the harmony of the, the color harmony going, mm -hmm. but make that yellow a different shape and look and everything all together. Right. Kristen, hey. would you ever put any more of that, like not quite a lot of that yellow in the in here, but would you ever suggest pulling any of that warmer yellow into the background or is that what you were talking about like just leave that cool yeah so so colors get cooler as they go back in space and grayer or sorry yeah that uh, temperatures get cooler colors get grayer <laughs> so I think she's that spot on it's good yeah I wouldn't change that as one who always just puts a bunch of color in every bit of paintings, <laughs> I just was thinking that. So I was wondering. I'm really happy that you said it looked misty because it, it does. You go up to this lake and there's this kind of misty feel because it's kind of it's enclosed by a, a glacier and mm. so, yeah, just the way the sun kind of comes into the space, it's really kind of misty, kind of light. So thank you, Kristen. I You're very welcome. Appreciate that. Okay. So I, um, I do mixed media work. And so I submitted this little guy that I had done a while back and I love a lot of its elements, but, um, it's a little bit busy and I just wanted, um, wanted Kristen's take on it. So, um, yeah, this is really beautiful too. I have to talk softly because my husband just got on a call. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a really nice organic natural feel. Um, and that's accentuated by the sharp edges of the white circles on top. It has a really nice layered look and um, it's really beautiful. I like your variety of shapes, circles, lines, and the writing in the, in the middle. And um, that little bit of squiggly black is like, if it didn't have that, it wouldn't work. You know, that's like one of the things that just really makes the painting work. And um, you've done a good job of connecting your colors so often in a painting you want to have darks connected lights connected blues connected and there's a lot of connection in all of the different hues that you have going on here and then those two dark spots at the bottom the blue spots are nicely weighted because they're really dark and it really gives it a nice balance so i wouldn't change a thing on this painting i just love it thank you yeah so yeah i really love this Thanks. you know like if you were to add green to it it wouldn't make it better if you were to add yellow to it it wouldn't make it better and that's how you sort of have to get through a painting you have to kind of say to yourself 
um, oh, I think it's missing blue, or I'm, I'm sorry, I think it's missing yellow. And then you have to kind of contemplate, well, if I add yellow, is it really going to be a better painting? And you have to answer yeah. that. And I, I say no. <laughs> kind of have to know um, when to when to stop and, and realize that if you keep going through ideas and nothing is clicking, then maybe you're done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm not sure. Do we have anything? Um, Jill, I just have to say from another mixed media artist, this is a really stunning piece. Oh, I man. can't stop looking at it and I just <laughs> keep seeing more and more and more. Oh, thank you so much. This was this was a fun one to work on and it got a little more bubbly than I thought that it was going to <laughs> with all the brown because I think sometimes I I'm not sure what to add so I just keep adding more of something and this time it was circles so this one is called sea life because it's a kind of a watery theme so what kind lovely. of surface did you work on what's that what, what's the surface that you're working oh, on oh it's um this is just a little eight inch round wrapped uh canvas oh really so it's, it's yeah it's just it's tiny um I should do it big but I don't I can't find a giant round canvas but um and then this is using just a whole bunch of different layers. This is actually a photo that I took that um, that I image transferred onto it, which is its own crazy process that I'm still trying to learn. And then these are um, paper cutouts. Um, and then, of course, I love just like old old fashioned writing and calligraphy and just that beautiful style of that. And then um, all these are just jelly prints um, that I used kind of paper cutouts and then used a jelly print and all that so mixed media man it is a whole um it's a whole world isn't it lynn <laughs> it is a whole world <laughs> um okay well we have I to see it, Jill. thank you oh, Jill, thank it's beautiful you. oh you guys thank you i really appreciate those words of encouragement they mean a lot sometimes with mixed media you kind of wonder since it's not always representational you know does it make sense and is it pleasing um Okay, so I just want to pop over because Kristen had a few more images to share and I just want to make sure that we see all of her beautiful work before we before we go and Kristen be thinking about if you want to if there's anything else you want to share before we wrap up but um, where was this. Uh, that was in Luca. In Italy in Tuscany. There's a little cafe. In Luca. Just said that's a tiny little painting <laughs> that I really oh, like. It's in Lucca. It's a town in Tuscany. No, is it? Is it? I was saying, saying is it small? Like how, how small do you think it is? It's it's six inches by eight inches. Oh my gosh. Oh, really wow. Small. Fit that much in there. Okay. And then talk about this one. This one surprised me as far as the style goes because it's a lot more smooth than. Yeah. So this is a watercolor. That's a watercolor? Yeah. And I am just, I love birds. And, uh, so I, I, and I really love these hyacinth macaws. Mm. And so um, I just wanted to do a painting of them and give that real misty jungle feel, you know, make it feel like it's hot. And um, they're eating these things called a curry palm nuts, which is one of their favorite foods. And um, so I, I know I do a lot of different styles. This is um, 22 by 30 inches. Okay. So pretty big. So that's why I say I can teach um, how to paint very realistically or very impressionistically. This is from Mexico Beach that we went to in Baja. Mm. I just was in love with the color turquoise and all the textures of the reef rocks and painting the rocks underwater. And um, so that's an a, example of that sort of green blue and then contrasted by the more purple blue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think this may be the last one I have. So here is, I'm assuming all palette knife here. Yeah, so so is the one before, the beach one is all palette knife. This is um, palette knife too, um, backyard garden. Yeah, Gorgeous. and just playing with color and shapes and massing the colors of the flowers together and kind of giving a little path in there. And um, I, I really love color and color passages and having interesting groupings of colors. And so this is sort of a good example of that. Beautiful. Um, Jill, could you go back to the parrots just for one moment? Absolutely. Um, Kristen, I am in awe um, of how you kept your watercolors so vibrant and bright layering, because it looks like oh. it's layered. It is layered, yeah. yeah. Um, 
I just get mud <laughs> when I try to do that. <laughs> so I, I just, I just have to say how, how, uh, how much I really, really like this. And I'd love to learn how you did that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's really fun um, to, to teach different styles because everybody learns more. So, um, but yeah, I'll, I'll teach about layering the secrets of not getting mud because um, I hear that a lot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and there are secrets to not getting mud. So, yeah. Kristen, is this Posca pin too, or is that? Oh no, that's, um, that's opaque white watercolor. Again, wow, impressive, mm -hmm. love it. Yep, I've never been able to uh, achieve anything like this with watercolor, especially layers. It seems like if I put something on top of an existing watercolor thing, then it's, I've just ruined it. So yeah, you have a lot to teach. <laughs> and yeah. so I'm gonna stop my screen share real quick as we wrap up, but tell us when, um, so your group is gonna launch in July, is that right? I feel like it. I saw July 20th, is that right? I don't remember the date. Okay. I know, Something like I know that. You sent it to me. Yeah. Um, maybe um, you can look it up and tell everybody, but I believe it's, I wanna say like July 20th or something, but don't, I'm no, I think I saw July 20th too. And Susan Richardson is um, going to be navigating that for you. And um, okay. so, yeah, if anybody um, has any questions, feel free to contact us at Masterius or reach out to Kristen. Um, you're on Instagram and have a whole bunch of good stuff on there as far as videos. And then you also yeah. have your YouTube channel, which is Kristen Olson with an O <laughs> stone. Um, yes. Yeah, um, yeah, get in touch with me if you have questions about supplies um, or anything. Just feel free to send me a message. I'd love to hear from you. And I'm also giving a live demo for Mastrius on, uh, hang on, let me just look at my calendar. <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry, let's see. Um, from 4 to 6 p.m. Pacific, like California time, on the 29th of June. Oh, good. Bob, let's <laughs> tune into that, everybody. I'll send a reminder as we get closer to that. Wonderful. Any, any last words for Kristen? Thank you so much. Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for having me. Hey, thank you so much, Kristen. And thanks for coming, everybody. And thanks to those of you who submitted critiques. That was really fun and nice to meet <laughs> all of you, too. So thank you, Kristen. Take care. Thank Bye. you, Kristen. <laughs>